So yes, I'll be talking about detection of parallel universes through mini black holes. Now, uh, these words might seem completely unfamiliar to you, but that's why I'm speaking. By the end of this talk, you'll understand what they mean. <laughs> So what are, what are parallel universes? Parallel universes extra, exist in extra dimensions. To understand that, we have to understand what dimensions are, what extra dimensions are. To understand extra dimensions, let's start from one dimension. What is the one dimension? Well, the simplest example of a one dimension is just a line, a straight line. You move around, you, you just have one way to move around it. And if you keep going, you just keep going around that line. Now you can take this line and you can curve it, form a circle out of it. Now what happens is that you end up from where you started from. On a circle, if you move on a circle, you will end up where you started from. On a straight line, you'll just keep going ahead. This straight line is an example of a one-dimensional flat object, and a circle is an example of a one-dimensional curved object, okay? That's as far as one dimensions go. Beyond that, two dimensions. Well, now you have two directions to move. Imagine a sheet of paper. You can go along the length or along the width. But if you keep going, you will just never come back. You will keep going around that length. <laughs> and if you keep going on the other way, you will still keep going. You'll never come back. This is an example of a two-dimensional flat object. Interesting thing about a two-dimensional flat object, draw, uh, draw any two points on this two-dimensional sheet of paper. Then the shortest distance between these two points is a straight line. What's a two-dimensional curved object? Well, you can take this paper and make a globe out of it, something like an... <clears throat> So like imagine a small globe or imagine the whole Earth. But this is like a surface of the Earth or a surface of a globe is an example of a two-dimensional curved object. Now, if you go along one direction, you'll still come back to where you started from. If you go along the other direction, you'll still come end up, uh, end up from where you started from. This is an example of a two-dimensional curved object. Okay, so far so good. It's easy to understand. The interesting point to note here is that the, the shortest distance between two points on a two-dimensional curved object, say this earth or a globe in your hand, is not a straight line. It's a curve. So if you have a globe and you draw two points on it, the shortest distance between these two points is a curve, not a straight line. You can go to a three-dimensional flat object, still easy to understand. You have three directions to go. You can go along the length, along the width, or along the height. If you keep going in one direction, you will never come back. An example of a three-dimensional flat object. But now things start becoming really difficult because we, uh, we have not evolved enough, our brains have evolved enough to understand two-dimensional curved objects and three-dimensional flat objects. Our brains have not evolved to understand three-dimensional curved objects. But you can work by analogy. So what did I say about two-dimensional curved objects? You go along one direction, you end up from where you started from. You go along another direction, you still end up from where you started from. Now for a three-dimensional curved object, if you go along this direction, you'll end up from where you started from. You go along this direction, you'll still end up from where you started from, like the globe. But if you go up, you will come from down. <laughs> okay, it's difficult to imagine, but such an object is very easy, to, like easily constructed mathematically. Higher dimensions, very, very difficult to draw. But again, you can work by analogy. You can have four-dimensional objects where you have four directions. And if you keep going along one direction, you will never come back. Uh, it's an example of <laughs> a four-dimensional uh, flat object. You come back along from where you started from in all the four directions, an example of a four-dimensional curved object. Similarly, for a five-dimensional curved object, six-dimensional curved object, six-dimensional flat object, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine objects of any dimension whether curved or flat. There's nothing mysterious about extra dimensions. They're really mysterious things in physics, weird things in physics. Extra dimensions is not one of them. <laughs> extra dimensions is very straightforward concept, yeah. <laughs> now, something very interesting about extra dimensions. You can have lots of, you can draw lots of parallel lines on, on a sheet of paper. So basically, what can you do? You can have lots of one-dimensional objects in a two-dimensional object, parallel to each other. You can have lots of two-dimensional objects parallel to each other in, <coughs> along the height. So you can have lots of two-dimensional objects parallel to each other along a third dimension. This, is, this becomes really important when we talk of parallel universes a little ahead. Similarly, by analogy, again, you can't imagine it, but by analogy, and <coughs> you can do it mathematically, you can have lots of three-dimensional objects parallel to each other in a fourth dimension. You can have lots of four-dimensional objects 
parallel to each other along a fifth dimension, and so on and so forth. You can have any, num any object parallel to each other in a uh, higher dimension. <coughs> So it's not, nothing mysterious here. And that is still, the, I did no physics, this was mathematics. So done with mathematics, let's go to some physics. So the first thing I want to tell you about is the fact, uh, <coughs> which is the foundations of uh, special theory of relativity, and that is the velocity of light, or the speed of light, is the greatest speed any object in the universe can attain. This leads to some obvious paradoxes. For example, if there is a car and you throw a ball, and you throw the ball with the same force when you're standing, the, if the speed of the ball normally is u and the speed at which the car is moving is v, then the speed when you're throwing the ball from a car will be u plus v. Basically, when you're throwing a ball, if you're stationary, it's just the speed of the ball. And when you're throwing the ball moving, uh, sitting, uh, sitting in a car, it's your speed, uh, like the speed of the ball plus the speed of the car. Quite straightforward. If you do the same experiment with light, like you, <coughs> on a flash of light, it moves with a certain speed. Now, if you on a flash of light moving in a car, it still moves with the same speed. The speed of the car does not add to the speed of the light. So where does the speed of the car go? Because it can't add to the speed of the light. Light is the fastest object. <laughs> so where does the speed of the car go? This, is, this has led to some paradoxes. And to resolve this paradox, Einstein proposed that time was the fourth dimension. So everything you know in our universe has length, breadth, and height. Einstein said actually time is like the fourth dimension. This leads to all the weird effects we see in special relativity. Many of you might have heard about it. So it's like the twin paradoxes. So if there is Alice and Bob, they are twins, twin brothers, <coughs> and one of them goes on a space journey at very high speed, comes back. One of them is an old man. Bob is an old man, and Alice is still young. <laughs> and this is because time has flown at a different rate for one of them than for another. And this is quite paradoxical, but this happens. <clears throat> that, that, that was special relativity. So special relativity, what did it say? It said that time is the four dimension. And it's, there's nothing mysterious about four dimension. I just told you about four dimensions mathematically. <laughs> what does general relativity say? Well, I told you dimensions can be flat or curved. You know, and I gave you analogies and examples. So general relativity says that the space and time curve in presence of matter, and this curvature makes things fall down. So time flows at a different rate here on the floor than it flows on the roof. This is what I've drawn, <laughs> tried to draw in this cartoonish image, that time flows at a different rate on the floor of the room than the roof of the room, and this difference in the flow of time makes things fall down. This difference is so small that you can't actually detect it. But this difference is what makes things fall down. Amazing but, yeah, and interesting. Gravity's rainbow. What is gravity's rainbow? This is what I worked on last year. And that's what you just heard about. And that's possibly why I'm speaking here. <laughs> so gravity's rainbow is a generalization of Einstein's theory of relativity. What it says is that, that it not, only does <coughs> not only is gravity the difference, the curvature of space and time, this curvature actually depends on who is observing it. So if you, there are two friends, Alice and Bob again, Alice has an energy E1 and Bob has an energy E2, for Alice the time, the time difference between the floor and the roof will be different from Bob. So it's quite interesting, like there is, no, and, and I told you gravity is the curvature of space and time, and space and time is the fabric of reality in which everything physically exists. So what is gravity rainbow telling us? Gravity rainbow is in fact telling us that the fabric of reality depends on the observer. So this, there's something observer dependent. There, you know, there's something not that objective. It's, uh, the whole reality reduces some, some way to uh, a bit of a subjective experience of the observer, which is amazing. <laughs> but these effects only occur at very high energy scale, so you don't really observe them at our energies. They occur at very, very high energies. Gravity rainbow also predicts that there's a maximum energy, just like special relativity says that there's a maximum velocity beyond which nothing can go, which is the velocity of light. Gravity rainbow is based on the assumption that there's a maximum energy in the universe, and you can't really go beyond that energy. This is really needed because what we expect from various different approaches to reconciling general relativity with something called quantum mechanics is that space and time should cease to exist at a very small length scale. Which is interesting because it again reduces, it makes space and time 
and everything in it, everything you see in this room, the chairs and everything in it, an approximation. At best, an approximation, even at most an illusion to something which is more fundamental, a purely mathematical structure. And one of the ways of incorporating this information in general relativity is gravity's rainbow to make space-time energy dependent. So, <clears throat> so far so good with gravity's rainbow. Now let me come to something very simple, as simple as a black hole. So black holes are very simple objects, actually. What are, what are black holes? To understand black holes, we have to understand something called escape velocity. So if you throw a stone up in the air, it'll come back. If you throw it a little harder, it will still come back. But if you throw, like, with a, with a rocket or something, if, you, if the uh, st stone has enough speed, then it will just never come back. That's what happens with rockets. <laughs> they just go away. And there's a critical speed. <laughs> There's a critical speed on, for every planet, for every star, for a, for a particular object of a with a particular gravity. And if you throw anything with that speed, it will just never come back. And this speed is called the escape velocity. So I've denoted the speed with which things fall back as u1, and I've denoted the escape velocity by u2. Okay. Now what happens if a star becomes, the gravitational field of a star becomes so strong that its escape velocity equals the velocity of light? Then light doesn't come back, it just turns black. But I already told you that nothing can travel faster than light. So if light can't escape it, then nothing can. <laughs> so nothing can escape the gravitational field of that star object. And this object is called a black hole. Nothing mysterious so far about black holes. But now a little bit of mystery comes in when you take into consideration general theory of relativity. Well, according to general theory of relativity, if you're going inside a black hole, you will just go inside it, say, in an hour, a day, a month, depending on how far you are. But you will go inside it in a finite amount of time. But if your friend who is, and that's what I've denoted in the first two pictures, you're going inside the black hole, you end up inside the black hole. But if your friend is sitting outside, and he is noticing you go inside the black hole, he will just never notice you go in. He will just notice you getting slower and slower as you go towards the black hole. He will never notice you go inside the black hole. Because for him, you will take an infinite amount of time to go get inside the black hole. But for you, you will just get inside the black hole because you will, <laughs> you will get inside in a finite amount of time. But you're, for your friend, you will take an infinite amount of time to get inside the black hole. And even though this seems paradoxical, we know space and time is relative, so not a big paradox there. <laughs> string theory. Why am I talking about string theory? Because I want to come to extra dimensions. Have you seen a small, uh, small uh, string of dust or a small piece of your hair in the barber shop? Well, it, it is like a string, but if it's a really, really small piece, it looks like a dot if you don't have magnifying glasses. But if you look, it, look at it, under a magnifying glass, then you will actually see that it has a structure. It looks like a string. And this is the idea of string theory. Everything in the universe around us is made up of elementary particles. But these particles, string theory asserts, are actually strings. We are not just looking at it under enough magnification. And then there can be two kinds of strings. There can be open strings, and there can be closed strings, like a circle. But there is a problem here. The problem is that string theory predicts that there should be 10 dimensions. We know everything in our universe has three dimensions of space. So everything has a length, breadth, and height. And I told you Einstein said that time was the fourth dimension. So where are the remaining six dimensions? And that's where <coughs> the mathematics I taught you at the beginning of this, this lecture comes in. I told you things can exist as sheets in higher dimensions, one dimension, like you can have lots of parallel lines which are one-dimensional objects in a two-dimensional setting. You can have lots of uh, two-dimensional objects in a three-dimensional setting and all. So maybe our four-dimensional universe exists like a sheet in this higher dimension, ten-dimensional framework of reality. And that, is, <coughs> that, and that is possible. And that is what people came up explaining uh, why ten dimensions exist. But then, why should this universe or this sheet be the only sheet? Maybe there are many sheets parallel to each other in this time, <laughs> along these higher dimensions. And that is where parallel universes come in. So the parallel universes is this concept that there are many sheets parallel to each other in this higher dimension, 10 dimensional setting. And all of these sheets are like four dimensional universes. So lots of parallel universes parallel to each other. And then strings, you see you can have 
open strings attached to our universe, so they can't really leave. But if they are closed strings, they can actually leave out of our universe. And the, it turns out that these closed strings actually denote gravity. They, are the, they denote gravitons, the particle for gravity. So what it means is that gravity leaks out of our universe. And that, that might be the reason why gravity is so weak. I mean, you take a small magnet in your hand and it overcomes the force of an entire, the gravitational force of an entire planet. Why is gravity so weak? And this might be the reason, because it's leaking out of our universe <laughs> into extra dimensions. You know collisions, nothing mysterious about that. Take two balls, collide them, they go away from each other. Why am I talking of collisions? Because at CERN, right now, we're taking elementary particles and we're colliding them at really high energies. <clears throat> and it turns out that if extra dimensions exist, this is very important. You see, if you collide particles at very high energies, you can form mini black holes, but only if extra dimensions exist. Why? Because normally in our four dimensional setting, the energy needed to form these mini black holes is really, really great. So great that you can't really form them. But if extra dimensions exist, then you can actually form them because the energy needed to form these mini black holes is considerably reduced. But it's reduced so much so that we should have already seen them. And we did not see them. And that's where gravity's rainbow and our work comes in. What we demonstrated last year is that if you take into consideration gravity's rainbow, and you can do the same thing with many other approaches to gravity, then this energy is slightly raised. And it's raised exactly to the amount at which the LHC is operating right now. So. And that's what makes it interesting. So if we do see uh, parallel universes at LHC right now, then we will know gravity's rainbow is correct, and then we will have proof for extra dimensions, for parallel universes, and for string theory. And that's where I want to leave you at. <laughs>